Okay, I'm honestly pretty tired from answering these questions. I feel obligated to because, you know, really this th these things haven't really been an issue while I was just teaching on my wall, but some people shared it beyond the wall, and now there's pe they're being forced to field questions uh, that are beyond the scope of what they've had to deal with. So I feel like I have to provide some of the answers, and really it's exhausting. I, you know, I'm... Um, but that's where this is coming from. Um, there does seem to be um, some confusion over the overlap because there's an overlap between the New Testament or the New Covenant and the Everlasting Covenant. But first of all, yes, the Testament and the Covenant, it's the same Greek word. And it's this, in one sense, it, it, it refers to the same thing. Um, in, in that, there is an inheritance secured for the people of God by the blood of Jesus Christ. But what secured that inheritance? What covenant secured that inheritance? It is a covenant, but it's not a covenant made with us. It's a covenant made for us with the shepherd of the sheep. And that's called the everlasting covenant. Okay. Um, Hebrews 13 refers to the fact that Christ was raised from the dead by the blood of the everlasting covenant to be made the great shepherd of the sheep. His role in shepherding us into eternity is based on a covenant that he has with God. He, as the Son of God, made a, an agreement with the Father to come and shepherd those sheep that were the fathers that the Father gave to him home and lose none of them. And that's his keeping of the covenant. And when he gave his life, he gave his life uh, before God as part of that agreement, as his part of that agreement. Um, okay. Now that we say is the everlasting covenant and that covenant is what makes Christ really why it's why he came. Okay. It was made, I believe in eternity past. Um, he, that's why he's the lamb slain before the foundation of the world. And now when he came, he is the seed of the woman, the seed of David, and the seed of Abraham. And as such, he is really the heir of any promise that God made to man. So on the one hand, there's a covenant, which refers to God, Christ's role in fulfilling God's will. And on the other hand, there is a testament. It's the same thing in that sense. The everlasting covenant also is a testament. For us because the death of the testator has occurred and you can use the word interchangeably in that sense okay um it produces some confusion to do so but it also produces confusion not to do so obviously so this is just where we're not chastising people for using certain terminology or anything like that we are just exploring this um because it has implications for us now what, what I'm saying is it is important to understand that the new covenant for Israel is not the covenant that our inheritance is based on. Our inheritance as members of the body of Christ is based on the everlasting covenant. Now that covenant was confirmed with Abraham's seed in Genesis 15. Um, and Paul refers to this in Galatians 3, uh, where he says, uh, first of all, it's, um, sorry, I gotta, I gotta get to the verse. Uh, okay. Brethren, I speak in the matter of men, though it be a man's covenant, yet if it's confirmed, no man disannuls or adds to. Now to Abraham and his seed were the promises made. He has said not, and to seeds as of many, but as to one, thy seed, which is Christ. So he's saying the blessing of Abraham, the inheritance, um, the promises, were really made to one seed, which is Christ. And that was based on a covenant that cannot be added to or disannulled by anything that comes later. Okay, And he's using that to say that the law which came 430 years after this could not make any, could not disqualify or nullify the inheritance 
that was guaranteed by the co this covenant that God confirmed with Abraham's seed. Okay, the, the point I'm establishing is that it is the everlasting covenant that secures our inheritance. And Paul makes that point, that it is not the Mosaic covenant, but a covenant that was ratified or confirmed with Christ 400 years, 430 years prior to that. And this I said, that covenant that was confirmed before of God in Christ, the law, which was 430 years after, cannot disannul to make the promise of no effect. For if the inheritance is of law, it is no more a promise, but God gave it to Abraham by promise. So he's saying, look, your inheritance is related to your position in relationship to Abraham, not to Moses. And the law is the covenant that God made with Moses. The law is the covenant that God made uh, through Moses with the people of Israel when he brought them out of Egypt. And it was added for transgressions. It was to show them that they really were not fit to inherit the kingdom that Abra he had promised them through Abraham. He brought them out of Egypt to fulfill the promise he made with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. But when he brought them out, he still needed to show them that they still were not fit to represent him because the blessing was that they were going to be a holy nation real holiness. Um, so he put them under the old covenant, the law, to show them their need for something new. Okay. Um, but he says, wherefore then serves the law, it was added because of transgressions till the seed should come to whom the promise was made. And it was ordained by angels in the hand of a mediator. Okay. Who's the seed? Christ. Uh, the mediator is not a mediator of one, but God is one. He's saying, look, a mediator is, assumes that there's two parties in a covenant, but God is one, and he made a covenant with himself. God, the Father, made a covenant with Christ. Christ is the Son of God on one hand, but he's the seed of David and the seed of Abraham on the other, as the, as the Son of Man. And it is that man who ultimately inherits all the promises. And when he died, he became the mediator of the inheritance. Uh, the, the covenant with Christ became a testament for all of us, okay? Uh, so it becomes a matter of inheritance for us, not something where we are parties of a covenant with obligations to fulfill. That's the point. Um, is the law then against the promise of God? God forbid, if there was a law that could have given life, righteousness would have come by the law. Um, but then he, he goes on to talk about uh, how the law was a schoolmaster. But then here's where he establishes our relationship with Abraham. He says, For you're all children of God by faith in Jesus Christ. For as many as of you have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. There is neither Jew or Greek, neither bond or free. There is neither male or female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. And if you be Christ, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. As a Gentile, how do you have any kind of connection to the Abrahamic covenant? that makes you an inher inheritor, you don't. You're aliens from the covenants of promise, strangers. You have no parts in covenants. Those are for Israel. Paul confirms that in Romans, that to them belong the covenants. Um, well, what do we have? Well, we've been baptized into Christ. Christ is the real Jew, <laughs> and Christ is the seed of Abraham to whom all the promises were made. We are passive in this. When we believe we were baptized into Christ and now he is sharing his inheritance with the church. And the church is made up of anyone who believes after the resurrection of Christ. Whether Jew or Gentile doesn't matter because we're baptized into the death of Christ. We are crucified with him and we're raised together with him as part of a new creation which is called the new man where there's no Jew, no Greek, but Christ is all in all. And that is a different entity with a heavenly trajectory than Israel that will inherit the earth during the time of the millennium. They have an earthly inheritance related to the land. We have Christ as our portion, and we will reign with him as his co-heirs. He shares the rod of iron that God promised him with the church, um, that he will rule not just Israel, but the nations. Okay, Israel, during the time of the millennium, 
as the mortals who survive the tribulation and go through that period will enjoy an exalted status in the land according to the inheritance that was secured not through Moses, but by Abraham. They're Abraham's seed as well, physically. And if they believe in Christ, though, it's like they almost have a double portion. They are, uh, well, they inherit the land, okay? And th But these are mortals. So they have Christ ruling on the earth, and they are mortals in the land. And they are not, though, members of the body of Christ. They're something else. Paul makes it clear that there are three groups of people. Israel, the Jews, or, I'm sorry, the Gentiles, the church, and Israel. This is the distinction that dispensationalists make, is that we say Israel, national Israel, has a future role and destiny called the Millennial Kingdom, in which Christ will bring them into the land and situate them uh, in their inheritance. Now, on the one hand, that inheritance was secured by the everlasting covenant that Christ made with the Father. On the other hand, their, uh, their ability to enjoy that inheritance was limited in the past because of the flesh, Okay, because that inheritance requires that they're able to maintain a kingdom and stay in the land and not apostatize and not backslide and not deviate from God, but to be his people. And they were never able to do that under the law. And the law was designed to show that. Then there is a new covenant with them, okay, that will enable mortals during that time to live for a thousand years and never backslide. If you really believe seriously that the church is presently enjoying that position, then if you've backslidden, you've got a problem. If you've ever backslidden or dealt with the flesh, or if you're not in the land enjoying the physical blessing, which we're not, you've got a problem. You have to allegorize the promises in the new covenant to apply it to, his, uh, to the church. You have to allegorize the land promise, uh, the land promise, where he says, I'll plant you in the land. You couldn't keep the Mosaic covenant. You broke it and you were dispersed through the land, nations, even though you were heirs. Okay. So now I'm going to bring you into your land. It is better. It is good. And I'm also going to write my laws on your inward parts so that you stay in the land. Even though they were heirs while they were under the law. Be, because they were still mortals and in the or because they were in the flesh and had not the benefit of the new covenant they weren't able to maintain their position in the land and either would we if we were stuck in the land and told you know you had to stay in here and keep the law we couldn't the law only condemns sin they needed something better but still that thing that came in only governs the new covenant governs mortals and it replaces the Old Covenant, which also governs mortals. But the new, uh, the everlasting covenant that Christ made with the Father that makes him the shepherd of the sheep carries all the way into eternity. Um, it carries us into eternity. It secures our glorification and ultimately theirs as well. Eventually, all of this will be wrapped up in the new city, Jerusalem, at the end when God Christ hands the kingdom up to the Father and God is all in all. Okay, so we're talking about temporary conditions uh, for mortals. So Christ is dealing with things related to resurrection, death and resurrection, but he's also dealing with things related to what do you do with mortals, you know. During the millennium, there are two groups of mortals, at least. There are the Gentiles and the Jews. The Jews will be governed by their new covenant, and the Gentiles will learn from the Jews. That will be the exaltation of Israel in their land. We, as the bride of Christ and as members of his body, have a special portion during that time. We'll be servants as well. We'll be ministering, but we will be resurrected and glorified. Um, and apparently it's a slightly different kind of glory than what uh, maybe the Jewish people who are resurrected during that time enjoy. Because 
1 Corinthians 15 that says that there's different kinds of glory. And we know that there's heavenly, uh, there, we are tra- to be transfigured unto the likeness of his heavenly body. And we're destined for a heavenly glory to be conformed to the image of Christ. Um, the resurrected Israelites, will that be the same? I don't know. Uh, but the point is, um, the when Christ died, his blood was the blood of the everlasting covenant that he made with the Father, and that's what secures everybody's inheritance. And then the new covenant really just describes the conditions that are needed for mortal Jews to maintain their position in the land during the millennium. Uh, But it's okay to call it a testament because it's the death of the testator. And that the, the, he, when he died, he, even though he only mentioned the new covenant in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, because he's speaking of Jewish things, he still died as the shepherd, uh, as the other party in the everlasting covenant. And that blood is both the blood of the everlasting covenant and the new covenant. The everlasting covenant contains all the covenants. It contains the land covenant with Abraham. It contains the Davidic covenant with the throne. And it contains... Uh, the mosaic, co- the mosaic covenant, uh, the mosaic covenant's replacement, really, um, which is the new covenant. Uh, so yes, it, this is complicated, but it doesn't undo the work of Christ. It just distinguishes further the position that we enjoy as members of the body of Christ. We are not land inheritors; we are Christ inheritors in the heavens. And that position was secured for us in Christ Um, as he was as the seed of Abraham, the other party in the covenant, the one to whom the promises were made, and also as the shepherd of the sheep, the other party in the everlasting covenant made with the Father to keep us and bring us into glory. And that covenant has become a testament for us. For us, it is entirely a matter of inheritance. And really, it will be for the Jews as well. Um, But again, the New Covenant speaks of that part which replaces the Mosaic Covenant that allows for mortals to live in the land. The problem is that many people want to apply that covenant to the church. And that's where it causes some issues because it sets up expectations for a spirituality that we don't have. You know, that we, that it sets up expectations that you won't backslide. You won't depart from his ways. You will keep his statutes and ordinances. Uh, And it ties you to Israel's law forever, (laughs) which, you know, um, now as a new believer, this is not something you really need to worry about. I'm clarifying some things I've taught for the sake of people out there who are forced to answer questions because they I guess they're talking about this, you know. Um and yeah, people get really upset about theological things. They get they've got their hot buttons and and their, you know, I, I get it. I'm not mad at anybody who is disagreeing. I did have to shut down some conversations on my channel. People are going to do videos, people are going to call it heresy. Um I can only clarify so much. Most of it's in the books, you know, and uh it, you could go on and on and on about this point. If you don't agree, just, you know, file it away. I mean, uh, we, our unity is based on the fact that we're brothers and sisters in Christ. We don't need to s- disparage people who hold a different view on this, but we do need to contend for the truth as much as it affects our liberty in Christ and our position in Him. And my purpose in bringing up these teachings is always to help the conscience of believers who are bogged down with some of the more subtle implications of some of these beliefs that we've just inherited and taken for granted. Uh, okay, I'm exhausted. I'm going to try to take a nap. Talk to you later.